disorders for past uh, 30 years. She's a senior neurologist and uh, she's the director of Neurology Sleep Center in New Delhi. And she's currently the vice president of Indian Society of Sleep Research. So, and uh, yeah, she has been uh, awarded with various awards. What's and privileged to have you, ma'am, over here. And uh, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, I know it's been a little delay in my part, but I'm glad that I could finally join you and thank you for having me. Uh, so actually I have, you can shut this off and I think first you can stop sharing the screen. Somebody, I think I was doing it. Yeah. I've not prepared like, a, you know, talk, I mean, like not a talk, like a slides and stuff. So I thought that I would, it would be more like an interactive session <laughs> where I discuss some of the research that is currently available but we can have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes of a Q&A kind of session if people have some issues that they want, they want particular answers to. So I thought I'd do it like that rather than just giving like a didactic kind of a lecture. So I think uh, the points that I kind of prepared or noted down, we don't need to do the first two, three things. And that is, you know, uh, what is Down syndrome and how common is it, et cetera. So we'll come straight away. Uh, to the clinical features, uh, which again, you all are, I guess, um, really familiar with. And I am, you can always add to the list that I say why I'm talking about these is so that we correlate the facial and the other uh, physiological changes with the sleep entities. If that's, you know, what's what I'm trying to say. So they, we know obviously that the children have a lot of facial disform, dysmorphism and that is the lower face is hyperplastic. The upper face is also the muscles are not too good. There is a drooping of the whole facial musculature and there is hypotonia. So hypotonia of the body and the tone of the muscle, muscles which maintain the airway is also low. So that's one part of the thing that they have an issue with already. They also have something like a cognitive uh, impairment and there is an intellectual impairment to a, to a certain extent, of course, varying in different uh, extent. Then they can have cardiac problems, musculoskeletal problems, metabolic problems, obesity, and things like that. So keeping all this in mind, we do have certain abnormalities which are structural and if I may use the word physiological meaning function related also. So that's where we are with the children. So what are the risks and uh, disorders associated with this? Those are partly I mentioned earlier but cognitive impairment is a big factor and of course development of obesity, high blood pressure, and metabolic problems and things like appetite uh, increase, dysregulation of the food that one takes or the desire to take or a satiety. Uh, what are the different types of sleep issues in these children? So these have been divided into two major categories. So first I want to say it's not that these issues are not seen in other children. So these are the similar kind of issues which are seen in most kids, what happens is here, the prevalence is higher. That means larger number of children would have this uh, problems. So there are two major groups. There's one, a major is, in this one. What? Yeah. one is uh, behavioral problems and one is definitely something called as primary sleep disorders. So the behavioral problems are also a lot of them, which we can discuss a little bit more when questions come up, uh, but basically delay or difficulty in initiation. That means the child finds it difficult to fall asleep. Then there is a lot of something like uh, reinforcement, like, you know, they will keep asking for certain things, which happens in other children also, it becomes a little bit more in these kids. Then comes the primary sleep disorders and that the bigger chunk that we are trying to talk about today is this entity called as sleep apnea. 
Just mm. show you a device. So, uh, so what is sleep apnea? I think some people may be aware, some not. So sleep apnea basically means, or obstructive sleep apnea is the word. Obstructive means that there is an obstruction during sleep. And apnea means that there is a pause in the breathing. For adults, this pause has to be more than 10 seconds. For children, it's just equivalent to more than two breaths. So it's a different criteria. Like in adults, we say more than five is mild. In children, more than one becomes mild. You know, it's a whole different way of looking at the study, which we will talk about a little while. So what really happens is that this is the nose part and this is the mouth part and this is the breathing pipe. But in, if there is any obstruction, that means this airway kind of tends to close or becomes narrower, the breathing will get obstructed. So why do these children, so what is the prevalence, let's say, how common is the sleep apnea in children with Down syndrome? So there are numerous studies that I had reviewed. So it can range from 30, 40, 50, 60%. So average is like 50, 60% of kids at about four to five years of age. They have, um, somebody is on, so can have this sleep apnea. So why does it happen or why are they at a greater risk? That's why we talked about their facial structure. So some of them have what is called this lower jaw is already much smaller, the chin is very small, it's hypoplastic. Then the upper part of the face, also the muscles are not very well formed. So the airway just by their anatomy or just by their development or their condition is already narrow. Then usually we have these muscles in between here, which are tightened and keep this airway open. So there is hypotonia meaning that these kids, the muscles are very lax. And there is this big bulk of the tongue muscle, which when they sleep, it just goes, falls back and obstructs the airway. So these are a few causes that these kids are more prone to develop the obstructive sleep apnea. Third factor is the weight. When the body weight goes up, there is an increased accumulation of fat around these tissues here. Like you can have fat around the neck, fat around the abdomen, and then that causes further narrowing of this airway. So those conditions or situations make the child more predisposed to develop this condition called as sleep apnea. So keeping this in mind, in fact, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and Child Health have said that all children with Down syndrome should be screened at least for a sleep issue at about four to five years of age. And some have also said that it should be repeated. So now comes this important question that how would I know that my child has a maybe sleep apnea, I suppose, let's say. So the symptoms in a child are very different from the symptoms of an adult with sleep apnea. And that is generally I'm talking about. And of course, it would apply to kids with the downs as well. So they, one of the first things is a very restless sleep. So they have this lots of kind of moving around the bed at night. The sheets are very crumpled. They don't have a peaceful, restful night. Then they can have sometimes called a noisy breathing, uh, that there is some sounds and, you know, sometimes it's like, so you don't get that snoring sometimes in children. It's just a very noisy breathing. Um, then there is this mouth breathing. So which more, most kids with the Downs do have is because of their dentition and their facial structure, they are mouth breathers. But they can have sometimes like gasping at night. These kids also tend to find some postures which they adopt to improve their airway, little older as they get, 
so that they can get a better breath. So they can sometimes hyperextend their neck or they will sleep ulta on their, like lift their bums up, but head down and up. So they, try, they are trying to do something so that they can improve their breathing passages and try and keep this open. So it's like a self-measure that they do. So then, so these are the night symptoms. Also, uh, bedwetting is a symptom of uh, undetected sleep apnea. And if especially prolonged, that they are not able to control uh, this habit at night, one should definitely think of an underlying sleep apnea. So those are the night symptoms. Now, what about the day? The day these kids are sometimes lethargic and sometimes very hyperactive. And then this becomes a factor to produce or cause this hyperactivity. Then they can also have some slowing, like, you know, some um, that they go to schools or something like that. And the teachers will tell you that it's as if they're lost somewhere or they tend to put their head down and they don't seem very bright. You know, the eyes are very dull most of the time. So, so they can have all these symptoms during the day. They also can have irritability, et cetera. They're also very prone to develop recurrent URIs. Frequent cough and cold can come on, you know, and um, almost, I mean, wherever we are in people who are in the metros, the air quality is bad, but these kids are, almost not ever are free from this cough and cold. So these are some of the symptoms that one should get alert to, that what is the child's night like, the day like, and anything that we think uh, could be a factor which is causing this kind of an issue. Now coming to what else can they have? So I touched briefly about the other uh, behavioral sleep issues, which are like you know the insomnia, that they don't go to bed at a proper time, uh, they delay the bedtime and they, you know, might call out to their parents at night. So those are different kinds of a sleep issue, which is also very common in these children. So we've done the symptoms. Now we come to this thing that, okay, so I suspect my child has it. So what to do? So in medical uh, lines, we go through this process, which is first that you ask symptoms. And that is what is called as a history but we need to confirm this. So how do we confirm this entity that is there sleep apnea, yes or no? And this is by the test, which is called as a sleep study. Because whatever is happening is happening at night. So what is a sleep study? A sleep study, as the word itself tells you, is the evaluation of sleep and during the night. And you study the parameters. So depending upon what parameters we study, we divide the study into, let's say for simplicity, a complete study and a maybe just like a screening study. So we'll go a little deeper and try and understand, you know, advant advantages, disadvantages, how to choose. And I know that, you know, I, like I've dealt with one or two pa parents recently that when we tell them, so they're not able to decide. So we will you know, tell you the advantages and then we can go forward. Um, so the first one that I talk about a complete sleep study, we have numerous sensors which are put. So we start with, and these sensors are like, no, I'm sorry, I should have probably brought an electrode and shown you. It's just like a wire with a small little metallic tip, which is stuck on to the head at different specific points. And there are two around the eyes and we need some on the chin. And there is one which sits here to measure the breathing. Then there is a belt which comes for the chest breathing. We have the oxygen probe. And then we have some more for the legs, etc. So, But these are the ones which are required to an analyze or assess the sleep and the breathing. So you have sleep parameters, you have breathing parameters, oxygen and ECG through the night. This is usually done in a setup, which should be like a lab or a center or whatever, and under the supervision of a trained uh, technician who is able to generate that confidence in the child, to play with the child, and the process has to be started. This is carried on the whole night, and 
you view the recording that was obtained and we re report it the next day. So that's the complete scoring. Uh, what about some other techniques? So there are some other things now which are like uh, screening devices, which there are two, three companies. I'm just holding up one company, for example. So here there are sides where you can attach the sensors. So one, this will not have on the head, eyes and chin. This has on the nose and on the fingertip. And this is given to the individual. Patient takes it home uses it at night and it comes back the next day with the data and we record. So what is the difference? Difference is that this is okay to detect the respiratory and the oxygen problem. And we also can have a heart rate in some of these, but it doesn't tell you so much about the sleep quality, etc. cetera. Um, so how to choose uh, if one is the ultimate and the best one is the first one. But now say that if the child is like a big child, you know, 8, 10, 11, 12 years old, and sometimes very typically has the symptoms that I have listed. And we want to confirm the presence, then you can also go for this. So that's a, but a younger child who we are trying to really establish a diagnosis. We are not sure what it is. Then we should do the first one. And that is the level one study. So that's how you should diagnose and you should look at all their other parameters, the cardiac, um, the blood pressure, the body weight, the blood sugars, cholesterols, etc. as well. Then next question is, okay, so once we have found this, what to do? So based on the number of breathing issues that one gets in one hour of sleep, these children are labeled to have mild or moderate or severe and sometimes no sleep apnea. Then we obviously start saying that, okay, so what should be done? So what is the commonest cause? The commonest cause in children is usually this gland which sits at the back of the nose and which is called as the adenoid. Usually, this is the adenoid is like a lymphoid tissue, and then there are the tonsils in the throat. They together act like barriers for all sorts of recurrent infection. Uh, and they will, the adenoid decreases in size by itself. But persistence of adenoid, a large adenoid sitting, it sits at the back of the nose where it is joining the throat, doesn't allow the nasal breathing to happen. In fact, the children open up their mouth. It causes further impairment in the development of the upper jaw, lower jaw. It causes abnormalities in the teeth. So they will have dental problems and it will become a cause for sleep apnea. So thus, this has to be evaluated. I saw a child today, not, not Down syndrome, but five years old child who has had recurrent allergies and um, disturbed sleep ever since the child was born, in fact. And now the teachers have started complaining that the child comes to school and just puts their head down and sleeps. The child has still has bedwetting, has not gained any weight, is extremely irritable. And finally, the it has been seen that there's a large adenoid and she probably has sleep apnea, which we will be testing. So how to treat is to uh, find out what's really happening. And the first recommended thing is that if this is enlarged, we need to remove it and that is get rid of this obstruction. So the next question is that once this is done, is it cured for life? The, there is data now that research has shown that these children, when they are, they should be reevaluated firstly. So surgery should be done. They should be re-evaluated when, so it can be anywhere between two months, three months, four months also. Make sure that all the local healing has settled to check that is there some residual sleep apnea. So there is a fairly good percentage, maybe 20 to 30% who might get left with a residual sleep apnea. And thus, uh, this should be re-evaluated and then 
we have to use some other methods of treatment, which is something like a PAP therapy. The other thing that I wanted to bring to your notice was that there were large studies that I saw that though we talk about these symptoms, as I mentioned, it was seen that 30-40% of children, if you just went on the symptoms, uh, there was no evidence of sleep apnea, but the testing showed sleep apnea. So that's why that recommendation was made by the pediatric societies that children with Downs, please get them screened. So now coming to the last kind of part that's so why is it so important? Why are we so concerned? Let's, let's look for the sleep apnea. Let's pick it up. Let's do this testing. That has actually become very relevant for all children and anybody, but more for any child who already has a learning disability. Uh, it's well known that at night when we are sleeping, there is like a cleaning of the brain which is happening. Um, so it flushes out all in very simplistic manner, all the toxins that are accumulated. So it makes way for new information to come in. And it also enables whatever information we have to get stored. So it was a very interesting way that somebody said you sleep to learn and then sleep also to kind of cement that learning. And some things that you don't need, you sleep to forget also. So it's a very complex process which happens if the sleep is adequate in duration and quality. That's quantity and quality. So especially now keeping in view the children who already have a learning disability, if we do not improve their sleep, their memory because of an impaired sleep, we will add to their cognitive impairment. The other role of sleep is to maintain the metabolism, the food intake, the satiety. So if sleep is impaired, these hormones get impaired and there is a risk for obesity. It also maintains blood sugar levels and blood pressure levels and the car cardiac perfusions. So thus it becomes really important that we do whatever we can to get them for a good sleep. So I think that's what um, I was wanting to really say that um, important to recognize the entity and treat it appropriately so that if we are taking care of all the contributing factors which can impair the child's health, this should also be taken into consideration. Uh, whether it is sleep apnea, whether it is insomnia, whether it is poor sleeping habits. I mean, like, so I think the sleeping habits, I just want to touch on a little bit more. Uh, so this, that part is sleep apnea, but the sleeping habits, the timing, uh, the number of naps permitted, at what age should they be permitted is also very important. Like I told this child I saw is sleeping at 12 because, and very often I'm seeing children who are sleeping at 12 or 11 because the parents, some the father or somebody is coming home late, is working late, spend some time. And then the child gets up. I think we lost the connection. Is it just me or? I think no. I think yeah. it's yeah. Even, even yeah. I can see that it's freeze. So we'll just wait for a few minutes. Yeah, just let's wait for a while. Yeah.
sorry, I somehow just got logged off. Uh, so that's, I think, where we were. So I can answer some uh, questions or anything or any other things that you want to add, then we can discuss those. We have one query. I would like to know more uh, when there are no enlargement of adenoids, what else can be a reason for sleep apnea? So uh, that's what you know, we were discussing earlier that these children are at a risk because of their structural abnormality. So what I mean by structural is that if we look at this airway, it's contributed by the lower jaw, upper jaw, and the muscles. So these kids tend to have a smaller lower jaw, not a very well-developed upper jaw, the facial muscles are not very strong and there is hypotonia. So the muscles inside are not very strong. So those are the reasons that they can still have sleep apnea. Yeah, Doctor, I have a question. Um, so, you know, there are devices available which kind of uh, you can use at home. You can just buy online and they kind of give you a full evaluation of sleep. They also say claim that they detect sleep apnea. Uh, what is your view on that? Are they any reliable? Um, so, uh, there are two types of devices which are evaluating uh, sleep, like the self-trackers as we call them. You know, and they are the wearables. So they uh, come under the category, they don't come under a health category firstly. So that's the, where the difference is. So when they go through their process of validation, it's not very strenuous. And versus the health uh, devices, which have cleared US FDAs, European FDAs, etc. So that's why their uh, sensitivity, specificity, we are not going to be sure how it is. But that's why then I was saying that if the child is like a big child with almost like, you know, after 10, 11 years, if their weight is also good and your suspicion is high, you can then do the screening tests, which are sleep related devices. But I'll show you another one. So there is another one, which is something like this. So mm -hmm. this is this is a US FDA approved device for evaluating sleep in adults. But now there is a thought that, so there was a concept earlier that suppose you measured only oxygen through the night. Mm -hmm. Is that adequate? If the, it is a mm -hmm. severe OSA, then you might pick it up. But if it is a mild or moderate, you might miss it because oxygen by itself is not a good indicator. But something like this on the finger, it's worn for three nights in a row, will give you some kind of indication. So see, some of the testing is what is called approved by American academies and you know other regulatory bodies. Some is not approved, but we can use it to understand where we are and then move to the better testing. Let's put it like this. Yeah. So what device is this? Uh, what is it called? This, one, one just world, this world over, uh, overseas it was called as night owl. In India, owl. it's called as one sleep test. One sleep. And, and these night, are over the counter, like you can buy them. Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I think mm -hmm. it, a doctor has to write it. Oh. Over the counter will be those, you know, those nearables, wearables, which can tell you something yeah. about saturations and stuff like that over the night. But yes, so they, in short, let's put it like this, they can give you some indication. Some so indication. There are also things like uh, snoring apps now, you know, which can tell yeah. you the breathing. Yeah. And there are yeah. these oxygen saturation, usually will all these devices can tell you. Yeah. But the breathing indices, they're not very good at. And sleep quality, they're definitely not in good at. Let's put it like right. this. Right, right, right. The thing is that, you know, because uh, in our group, we have parents from all over uh, India globally as well. But in India itself, if people are from small towns, it's very difficult to get access to someone who has the knowledge of sleep apnea, yes. first of all. And then to even test, I mean, it's just not 
not possible for everyone to so what do we what do those parents what do what would be the advice to those parents so i think uh, let's uh, so see if we get some kind of kind of checklist types so some parents uh, definitely the child is obese let's say definitely mm -hmm. the night is really bad thrashing sitting up choking that kind day is really bad you know very tired putting the head down and i mean i've seen a few kids who the parents have worked very hard i mean they are pretty okay but if you find that the child goes to school or special schools and the teachers are complaining that he's just not energetic so these are uh, alarm bells should ring then maybe so two things can be done like i said if the child is like you know 9 10 11 12 years 30 kg 40 kg we can send off these from here these devices we can send by courier uh, videos are given on how to use them and we can get the information back something at least a step one and they meet a local ent get a clearance about find out what's happening to their anatomy at least step one or two together they can be done then based on some information that we get um we should move forward otherwise we will hamper or hinder the child's development and as you know i know your parents are working so hard so we don't want some little thing to keep bringing them back while you're putting in so much effort to make them better correct yeah absolutely thank you so much there's one question in the chat uh, hi my son will be turning 4 years next week he has a habit of rocking himself before going to sleep and while rocking he takes support of the door or wall he has started banging his head uh can can you help identifying the reason so these are self self soothing behaviors as they are called and uh, you know we have this entity called as body rocking and self rocking um so which can become a little bit more accentuated so sometimes you rock them some so usually sometimes they grow out of it or you have to start thinking that giving some calming atmosphere producing that little proper bedtime routine distracting him onto something else that's what will have to be done and see is he upset is he angry why is he doing that kind of stuff so these children with cognitive impairment little learning disability have more of this body rocking phenomena that yeah. we call yeah correct um, okay so okay to ask a question hi seema uh, hi doctor i'm I'm Amrita. I just wanted to ask you a question. Would that be all right? Yes. Um. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know, like, would you not recommend using a pulse oxy saturation as a screening tool for a OSA at all? Is that something completely out now? So, like I said, the views are different for this, you know, because they are saying mm. that it's not sensitive enough. Mm. So if you use it, if you find an abnormality, then it's then it's okay. But if your mm. suspicion is high, or if you want to do mm. Full OSA in or out, <clears throat> and this comes normal. So what I'm saying is, would you stop then, or would you go mm -hmm. ahead? That's what we are trying to say. So mm -hmm. screening, like see, you know, it's like trying to do if I do a random sugar for somebody, and if I yeah. find it abnormal, it's very good. But if my suspicion mm -hmm. is high, then I should do a fasting sugar. Right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I believe there are in a lot of places. it's a uh, pulse oxy is still the screening tool and yeah so I'm just like wondering said, yeah so whatever mm. we have available we should definitely mm. something is better than nothing but mm. if the suspicion is high pulse oximeter is not showing it then don't give up mm. keep moving to the next yeah. step that's what i would say mm. yeah definitely yeah perfect thank you thank you so much uh, vishal uh, question yeah hello ma'am uh, Uh, ma'am thanks for the talk uh, first of all uh, and ma'am next uh, just before you got disconnected you were talking about uh, managing the sleep of the child uh, different naps taking different naps or something we missed that part ma'am okay yeah sorry so what i was trying to say was that one is the sleep disorder and the other thing is something called as a sleep problem so okay. we as pa the as parents uh also have to focus on other sleep principles or the sleep requirements for a child as a child is growing so if the child is let's say very small but anyway let's say 4 years or 5 years they don't really need so many naps in the day 
but the parents are allowing them to take the naps. Then this, like this one, I'll give you an example. Like today only I saw the child is sleeping from about three to five. Then obviously the child was, they're saying the child doesn't go to bed at night and is keeping the whole household also awake. So the child will sleep at 12. So if you need, but the rules or the guidelines are very clear that we need a good chunk of sleep, continuous sleep at night for the child. We do not want these breaks that over a period of 24 hours, the child gets you know, 11 hours. No, that's not to be done. So that's what I meant. Second is what I was discussing with the other person for this body talking thing, is that in any case, a child needs that very strict bedtime routine. But these kids, even more so. So uh, start cutting off the stimulation by the evening. You know, you calm yourself, calm the child, the environment. So you have that very... So they enter into that very good feeling because they will need that uh, limit setting as it's called, that they will keep asking for things, they will keep wanting something to eat, drink, this, that. So you have to start withdrawing from that. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, so our uh, daughter uh, Dia is of four years. And now, since the uh, winters has started, uh, we see that uh, as soon as she goes to sleep, uh, some noise of that snoring comes out immediately after goes, going to sleep. So, uh, possibly there is some, see the airway is very small in a small child, if you think the nose. So, if there is some allergens, where exactly are you based? Which city? Udaipur city, Udaipur city, Rajasthan. Udaipur. So Udaipur is at least cleaner than other places. But if they have some allergies, they will start producing that snoring sound. So here I would say you should meet an ENT. Maybe they will, especially a person who's used to looking at children, they could be just some local allergy. They can give you some little sprays and, you know, bring that down. Then it will become better. Ma'am, since over a year, she's not having a sound sleep. Uh, she's She keeps moving from here and there. She finds some elevated place to keep her head uh, elevated. So if you send her picture, I will send you some WhatsApp number. Then let me look at her face. Okay. Does okay. she keep her mouth a little open also? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. all the time. Yes. Probably she probably has adenoids then. So, yeah. you know, we can get a simple x-ray is done, but it's called oh. as an x-ray, like a lateral view to look at the adenoids. Okay. That should be done. So let's see how big they are. Definitely. Give us some local anti-allergics and then keep a watch. But if it doesn't settle, then we will have to do some kind of a screening or something like that. Okay. So now somebody like this, you know, the child is not easy for them to come yeah. here, all that. So we can just have a look at the x-ray, maybe send you that little device for screening, see if we pick up something. But right. if we don't, then we still have to go ahead and plan for the bigger study. Right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment and uh, uh, query also, Dr. Bhatia. Uh, should we, should the threshold for taking off the adenoids and tonsils be a little lower in children with Down syndrome since we already have hypotonia in place? So, uh, because it's a very, very um, effective way of taking off one major component yeah. of sleep apnea. Yeah, so we should be a little bit more ready to get it done uh, for both sides, the parent side and the doctor's side. I don't know whether the other parent is here. I saw somebody the other day also who was being recommended. Um, so obviously there's hesitation. It's like a surgery, you know, should I get it done? Should I wait? But like I said, you know, it all depends if the size is very big, the child is definitely obstructed. It's not going to get better. And your effort to try and make the child cognitively better will start, you know, getting hampered. So better is to get that thing out, at least the obstruction. Yeah. And there are a few actually inhibitions regarding the anesthesia part also, which I keep telling there are only two things that we need to take care of, that the most of the anesthetists nowadays would know and we have on board also, that uh, the atlantoaxial instability, that part while hyperextending the, leg, uh, the neck while intubating, that is one. And uh, the agents generally are good enough now. And general anesthesia, tonsillectomy and adenoids are removed in general anesthesia. And general anesthesia is the safest anal anesthesia for our children because yeah. we are actually insecuring the airway. Yeah. So that, also, that worry should be taken away while uh, considering uh, surgeries for adenoids and tonsils. And I think just 
also yeah. they need a little bit more post op care you know so we should yeah. pick up some bigger places and you know places where the anesthesia backups are really good so besides just being a surgeon being good we just do should be clear that you know the hospitals we choose are where the anesthesiologists are also you know familiar i mean we don't i don't know how many we have special like pediatric anesthesia and stuff like that in bigger hospitals there will be but generally if there's a good a big hospital they'll yeah. manage post operatively well and just a comment also because just to emphasize on how important is sleep apnea in our children because uh, the the uh, the uh, incidence of pulmonary hypertension in our children is very high Hi. first 50% of our children have congenital heart diseases they contribute to pulmonary hypertension then the incidence of pul primary pulmonary hypertension in our children is high and then adds on almost 50% as you said the frequency of sleep apnea in our children is close to 50% 50% that yeah. is what i understand and uh, that again contributes to okay. development of pulmonary hypertension which actually we should be screening for pulmonary hypertension every uh, Uh, child with down syndrome and similarly uh, also a query like what age do you recommend uh, for a child with ds to have a first uh, sleep apnea study or sleep study usually they are mentioning at least after 5 years there should be one screening done and uh, how frequently do we need to reevaluate and you know, i couldn't get the any uh, article or research as to how frequently that they do mention frequently but i think it all will go maybe individually as the case goes but if the child at 5 years suppose is okay but then in about 7 years starts becoming really bad weight has gone up breathing has become much worse then one should definitely look into it again so they should keep i think every 2 to 3 years at least clinically one should keep looking at them and if any symptoms come then repeat the study even if the first study was negative absolutely thank you I think we've come to end of. Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. Ah, uh, ma'am, a lot of these smart watches now come with uh, sleep. Uh, like it records how how long you were in a deep sleep, how long you've been tossing and turning. Can they be used for screening? So that's what I was saying that they. So the smart watches have been compared with the actual sleep study. you know they've been validated and that's what the research has all shown they are okay for two things the sleep onset and stop of sleep break sleep offset so that timing part they are pretty okay but the internal uh, quality part that how much is deep sleep how much is rem sleep they are not there's a little lot of error so that we should not rely totally on this but like suppose you have your child and uh the child is let's say in a separate bedroom you don't know what child the child is sleeping what child yeah. so that sleep onset sleep offset it will give you okay okay and awakenings etc but not uh, the quality of sleep not 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 the rem the deep sleep well we shouldn't go by that that's not the parameter that it can measure let's say okay okay i mean they're improving they'll probably will improve a lot but as of to, like the last you know thing by the american academy said that clearly Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, our children have a lot of compliance issue also when it comes mm. to sleep study. So that is a major challenge major for challenge. getting it done for our children. Yeah. So I think that is why uh, parents are also looking out for options that they can do at home in their home setting. Yeah. But I think I mean I we understand that is not the best way, but uh, to get yeah. But I think it. yeah, you're right. I mean, I think we should do whatever we can in whichever circumstances we can, and. if possible we move to the best one but at least the screenings we should do whatever we can that's why the role of this oximetry was for so long very considered very important at least you'll pick up a lot more so ma'am when the electrodes are connected and they're tossing and turning won't they come off for anything no like they that? usually don't come off yeah there that's why the importance is to have a person there and now it is we have a concept of like the technician coming over and uh, doing the study i'm just just for the uh, for everyone's benefit yeah. so we know so, that what uh, options do we have so one so let's go over these options the first one is that the per, the child comes to a clinic or a center the technician is there the whole night 
and the sensors are placed and we monitor the child the whole night. So if we get five, six hours of data, six, whatever, you know, we can still make out that is there significant sleep apnea, yes or no. Second is the technician comes to the child's home. Uh, that somehow the concept is mostly in India. It's not so much in other parts of the world. Uh, and it should be a little bit again for little older children. And because, how, because we can then apply two EEG electrodes, rest all the breathing channels. But somehow if we find that the child is just not able to leave the bed or the home and, you know, they are very restless and they're not going to sleep anyway, we, we are able to do that also. Third, like I talked about, is this kind of a gadget, which is like a two, three channel, but it's a one night given to the parents and it comes back. Fourth is this one, which is something like a, uh, a sleep test, it's called. So I think we have a few options. I'm actually also testing these days, which I am still verifying is something called as a ring. I don't have a sample right now, but it's worn like a ring. Uh, they've also validated that against, and it's a USFD approved to measure. So how does it measure, you know? Uh, so our the fingers have this blood supply which comes that's how oximeter is also measured no it's that you uh, the signal is emitted by the light and then it kind of picks up that signal but based on our nervous system we have something called this arteries which dilate and constrict and sympathetic parasympathetic so on some of those algorithms they have said that they can make out how much are the breathing disturbances per hour so the other problem actually we run into with children is that there's a separate criteria. So these are adult uh, validated criteria. That 10 seconds ka pause, so there is one apnea. Children, it is two breaths. If they are not equivalent, then there's one apnea. So these devices are not yet programmed to pick up that. So even if I put it on a child, it will show me AHI of five. So I don't know what it means. It probably means a 10 second one. But it will still show you a lot of uh, oxygen level fluctuations or something like that. So you will get some indirect idea. Then you, then you look at the adenoids, you look at tonsils, then you look at other things and you put some picture together and see what should I do next. Let's put it like this. Yeah, I think that will be a breakthrough if a child can wear something on a finger and you know, because even a pulse oximeter and I don't know how these devices are placed that the night out thing that you were showing. So it's, uh, it, how is it placed? It's, it's put on the last part of your digit and it's with a little Velcro. All right. Okay. So they have these Velcro, uh, these kind of bands, these tapes. With this, it is fixed on the last digit. Okay, that sounds doable also, no? Yeah. Uh, so like I said, uh, but certainly it struck me that the criteria for detecting AHI would be adult-based. But okay. like I said, if it's a 30, 35, 40 kg child, you know, it's almost like, and easily one can pick out something. Is anything happening? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So all these all these uh, devices, the both uh, the two devices that you've been showing, are they are basically programmed for adult sleep apnea? Yes, yes. Okay. So there are some uh, literature science says you know that they are now trying to measure some urinary breakdown products, etc., which can give you some in. So other problem which is coming up in all this is the like uh, we don't have any biomarker. So by that, I mean, like, if you want to test cholesterol, you test a blood, you'll see cholesterol is high. So people are trying, there is one Dr. Gozal Karke, he does a lot of work on the pediatric OSC. He's working a lot on trying to see that is there any biomarker, meaning that in the urine of these children, when they get hypoxic, if their breathing is not okay, are they secreting some kind of a chemical that we can pick it up and say, oh, this child has. So he has published some things, uh, you know, but it's not yet, I think very well widely accepted. Let's put it like this. So that was what's going to make things easier. That if you take mm -hmm. some other uh, body fluid and test it, you know that will yeah. be much. That will be simpler. Absolutely, yeah. 
Because it'll, but the biomarker right now, what we have is anti pro BNP till the time the child or the adult goes into right heart failure, and then we yeah, can, so that is that's we don't late. want to wait that long. Yeah, no, no, that is too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia, for your time. It was very enlightening. And it was, I think it is very important and very under-recognized uh, yes, under uh, issue, especially in our children. And it is across the age. Like, I mean, the, the, the babies have it and uh, it goes across till, you know, later in life. The sleep apnea is there in our people with uh, Down syndrome. So um, I think in summary, uh, we do uh, suggest everybody to get evaluated. At least one screening is mandatory for every person who has, is, I hope I'm understanding it right, that every person with Down syndrome is, should undergo a screening for uh, sleep disorders. And, um, and uh, should be, we should be able to correct it to a large extent. No? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. You have a good night. Yeah. Same to you all. Thank you again. Thank you so thank much, you. Doctor. Really thank appreciate you, doctor. your time and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Doctor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Thank you.